and welcome to Middle Way Mom Reads, where we dig into books that enhance and inform our homeschooling journey. I'm Shannon, a homeschooling mom since 2009 and a student of the Islamic Sciences at Mishka University. I've been using the Charlotte Mason method since about 2016, and I'm hoping that this series helps more parents realize the value of a Charlotte Mason method in their homes. We're starting with the most classic book in the Charlotte Mason method, which is the first book in her six volume series titled Home Education. We'll work through this book together, inshallah. I'll discuss highlights of the book without the assumption that you have read it yourself. But of course, you'll gain a much greater understanding if you read the book as well. So today we are picking back up with a section about knowledge that we as the family should have about nature and the benefit of this knowledge. So for those of you who are following along, we are on page 51. Um, and it's talking about flowers and trees. That's the the title of this um, of this section. She starts off with talking about um, she says sh- children should know field crops. So having this very basic understanding of the farming community around you in the sense of what are you growing? Um, what is What are the primary crops that are in your area? And then what does that look like? What does that process look like throughout the year? Uh, one thing that we see here in Minnesota is we grow a lot of corn, a lot of corn and a lot of soy. So We'll see those grow throughout the year. But one thing that this made me think of was growing hay. And there's actually like this whole process of this. Um, You can like look it up on YouTube, the process of, you know, making hay. Um, And so that's one process where you will see that a few times over the year of the hay grows up and then they cut it down and then they have the thing that like um, stirs it up so that way it can dry out better before they bale it, right? And so you'll see it through these different processes. So having some kind of general knowledge of that process, one, it helps you to be familiar with just the geography in your area in the sense of the things that you can grow or the things that are primarily grown from your area. Um, and two, Um, just being aware of where your food comes from. So, you know, for us, we get, I mean, I think every, everybody gets bananas and mangoes and these type of things at your grocery store. When's the last time you've seen a banana farm or a mango farm? And so just understanding which things can really be very fresh, um, and which things are being imported and all of that, just, it ties into so many little things. So I think a lot of us think, well, I'm not raising farmers, so we don't need to know about that kind of stuff. But there's a lot that goes into that. Um, it's a, There's a lot of things that that touches upon. It touches upon nutrition. It touches upon um, like the food, um, like how the food gets to you, like the ethics that are within that journey. What does that look like? Who are the people that are working um, at each step of that journey? So That is the first thing that she said that children should have some knowledge of is on the field crops. Second, she said field flowers and the life history of plants. So children should be able to describe some wild flowers that are very common in your area. She says they should be able to describe the leaf, its shape, size, growing from the root or from the stem, the manner of flowering, such as a head of flowers, a single flower, a spike, et cetera. So, you know, for us here in Minnesota, the dandelion is something that it, we know now that like it pops up. Um, I'm saying we know now, like my kids and I know now it pops up, you know, beginning of the summer. It's one of the first things to really bloom. So you don't see it throughout the year. And, you know, it has this bright yellow flower with a lot of teeny little petals and then it closes back up and when it opens the second time then it has um oh goodness I don't know what it's called but um it's essentially it's seeds and then it blows in the wind right so you can pick the dandy dandelion you can blow on it and the seeds will just disperse everywhere which is something that children love so knowing all of these pieces, one, it helps with their attention to detail, being able to describe these flowers. It helps with their vocabulary, with their 
um, descriptions that they make with their own words, because that can be something that's really tough. I mean, even me as an adult, as I'm describing the dandelion, it's trying to pick out the right words, because this isn't something that I do very often. So when they have this practice of describing something in detail, that this is something that can really benefit them in the long run, whether that is describing something to your spouse later of like, hey, I was hoping that, you know, you would help me with this project and this, this, this is what's entailed. Um, anybody who's been married knows that maybe one of us is less likely to give those details and the frustration that ensues from somebody not being clear of what that looks like um, to something simple as, hey, I, I'm looking for this one thing, you know, in a store, like let's say the hardware store where we're always looking for stuff in this gigantic store and we don't always know exactly what it is and being able to fully describe it. So these are not these are, this isn't, we said in the last section, this isn't just like tricks that you can show, you know, hey, look, my kid can describe this flower. These really are the building blocks to a successful, inshallah, a successful education built on really solid skills. Because without these solid skills, the various like tidbits of knowledge that you hand to a kid on a silver spoon, there's nothing that they can really connect with, or they can't access it again, or they can't describe it to other people. So what good is it? If I can sit there and I'm like, well, I knew, I know that like the American Revolution happened somewhere in the 1700s. What good is that for me? It's barely useful. So having this attention to detail really hones in so many other skills. What's interesting too is it's not just the flower, right? So going back to this flower of being able to describe it, describe its leaves, how it flowers, also being able to understand where does it grow? What are What's the environment in which you can expect to see it? We have now become quite familiar with black raspberries, um, and we look forward to it every year around the beginning to the middle of July, depending on the weather. And that's another conversation that we can have is, well, it's been really dry this year or the winter was very long. So maybe we're not, maybe we're just not seeing it yet. And we know it's kind of on the edges of forests. So when we're going on walks, like we know where to look for it. So this happens bit by bit. It happens so slowly that it's hard for you to really grasp that you're building on this, but it happens so intently when we come to this with full intention and with full um, wherewithal, with resources, those type of things, um, that, it, that you really see the fruits of this over time. So... When we make note of these things, there's a couple ways that we can, a couple resources that we can use uh, for this purpose. One is keeping a field guide near you. Um, so we have these ones by, I think it's called Stan Tequila. Uh, it's T-E-K-I-E-L-A. So we have like wildflowers of Minnesota. We have trees of Minnesota. He does a whole bunch of them, birds of Minnesota in all different states as well. And I like these ones because they are organized by color. Uh, we had picked up a field guide about birds that was organized into like warblers and sparrows and something else, right? Like, I don't know what those things are. I know that this is brown. So give me, <laughs> give me a book where I can look up the brown birds and we'll go from there. Um, so it makes it really easy for kids to pick it up right away and start working with it. So keeping this either in a backpack or in your car, and you can switch out those books during the different seasons. You know, we have a mushroom book so that we have that in the spring and the fall, because that's where you usually see those mushrooms. And even just switching out that book is going to help kids remember, oh, hey, it's wildflower season. I can start looking for wildflowers and it feels like these gifts that are awaiting them in these different places. 
Another way that they can kind of interact with this activity is they can press flowers into a book. You can look up, I'm sure there's a million YouTube videos and blog posts and that kind of stuff about how to press flowers. You can press flowers into their nature journals, but even better would be to teach them how to brush draw and having that brush drawing um, in their nature journal. Because when they are, when they're looking at this intently and then drawing it for themselves, then there's again, that element of detail where they start to have that picture more firmly planted in their mind, where pressed flowers sometimes can feel like a craft, like, oh yeah, I did that. Anyways, now I'm going to do something else. And it doesn't become something that um, is deeply embedded in us. So um, pressed flowers, good. Brush drawing, great. The next section is about the study of trees. So the trees that are around you on a day-to-day -day basis, these should be familiar. Um, so it's everything from a maple tree to an oak tree to an aspen, excuse me, to an aspen, to an ash tree. All of these, the kids should be able to distinguish one from the other. Even And again, this starts with one. Being able to say, oh, this is a maple tree. I know it because, da, 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 you know, the the leaves have this, um, like a five prong leaf, leaf um, and some of them are more rounded than others. They have these type of seeds. Uh, the bark has deep ridges like this. It has this certain coloring. And so we're really going to need to um, kind of pave the way and being able to describe those things. And that's where these field guides really come in handy, where if you don't already have that language, you can use these field guides to describe that for you. So for instance, this, um, I just opened up to creeping bellflower. The flower type is a bell. The leaf type is simple. The leaf attachment is alternate and the fruit is a pod. So these are all, now I can use all of these words. Is it a simple leaf? It is, it, is it an irregular leaf? Is it a lobed leaf? All of these I can find from this book. And um, we can start using that in our day-to-day -day language. And that's going to help us in a wider vocabulary as well. It's not just nature study. Nature study feeds into so much more. It is simply a very hands-on, engaging way to start that ball rolling. Uh, some of the things that you can notice about trees are how do the buds look in the spring? Um, embarrassingly enough, I thought the buds came out in the spring. Buds come out in the fall and they are packed in such a way, or they're, um, I should, the leaves are packed in such a way in the buds that they should overwinter just fine. So being able to describe those buds, what's the characteristics of the bark? Is it smooth? Uh, some of the birch trees have kind of like that, that, like the paper birch has a flaky bark that tends to kind of peel away. And a really good way to start on this with the trees is they befriend a tree for a year. So pick a tree in your yard. It could be your neighbor's yard. It could be, you know, your favorite park, but make sure that it's something that they can look at on a very regular basis. Ideally, this would be daily. At the very least, it should be weekly that they're able to look at this. And they can write this in their nature journal. You know, the tree buds have started to form or the tree buds have started to open. We now are seeing the leaves, the uh, the seeds are starting to form. Like right now we're seeing uh, acorns uh, on the on the oak trees. And that's something that we've been noticing from week to week is the size of the acorns on the oak trees and what that looks like at the beginning. So having this again week to week, being able to look very closely. The next section is on flowers, and there's this whole paragraph that I'm just going to read aloud because it's I can't I can't summarize it better, or I can't give uh, due right to it if I were to summarize it. I should say, 
So there's someone named Lee Hunt who says, suppose flowers themselves were new. Suppose they had just come into the world, a sweet reward for some new goodness. Imagine what we should feel when we first saw the first lateral stem bearing off from the main one and putting forth a leaf. How we should watch the leaf gradually unfolding its little graceful hand, then another, then another, then the main stalk rising and producing more, then one of them giving indications of the astonishing novelty, a bud. Then this mysterious bud gradually unfolding like the leaf, amazing us, enchanting us, almost alarming us with delight, as if we knew not what enchantment were to ensue, till at length, in all its fairy beauty, its odorous voluptuousness and mysterious elaboration of tender and living sculpture shines forth the blushing flower. End quote. The flower, it is true, are not new, but the children are, and it is the fault of their elders if every new flower they come upon is not to them a picciola, I think I'm saying that right, a mystery of beauty to be watched from day to day with unspeakable awe and delight. This picture, for me, really, it brought forth uh, some feelings where... We, we recently got chickens, um, and I mean, for how many generations was, it, was this, like, not a novelty? How many generations had chickens? And then it's like, our parents' generation didn't, maybe. I know, like, my in-laws, they both had chickens. Uh, my dad had chickens, and my mom was the only one out of those four that did not. Uh, but she had, like, aunts and uncles. So, really, it's like, our generation is the first one in how long... To not be like at least have some direct familiarity with farm animals. But it is what it is. And just the little thing, like we go out and we just watch the chickens. <laughs> we just like, wow, they're they I can't believe they put themselves to bed at night. You know, they go up in their roost and you just like close the door. And if we were to like when I'm posting on Instagram about this, I sometimes think like how many like people who are like really farmers are seeing this and they're like, why are you even talking about this? This is such a simple thing. You know, people have been doing this for millennia or maybe just centuries, what have you. Like what's, what is there even to talk about? And so when we're, are, when we're interacting with the maple tree that's in our front yard, when we're interacting with um, the grass that's growing in our yard and the clover and all of those things, are we treating it like the farmer maybe would be treating me about my chickens <laughs> where they're like, this is dumb. Why are we even talking about this? Like, this isn't interesting whatsoever, but it's interesting to the child because it's new. So allowing that wonder to grow into, um, to really lean into that, to lean into their wonder, because that is their love of learning. Uh, I have conversations sometimes with people about what does that love of learning look like? And it doesn't look like, hey, mom, I want to do some more math sheets. It looks like that wonder and curiousness is alive and well. That when they look at something that they haven't seen before, they're not like, oh, that's weird. They're like, wow, I wonder what that is. I wonder what more I can learn about that thing because I'm very curious about it. It's not I need to, I want to learn about this so I can tell other people so I can win a quiz bowl. It's I'm curious and I would like to know. That's the love of learning that we want to keep alive and well. Also, when we're when we have this close look at plants, whether it is let's say a sunflower and a maple tree, we're going to start seeing patterns that are over the different plant life. And we can, this really sets, sets the stage for being able to talk about um, the different kingdoms and phylum and all of these, like how do we categorize things? So what we see with plants is one, they they have leaves. They have something that we would call a leaf that absorbs that sunlight. They generally produce some type of fruit. Um, many of them will grow that fruit above ground. Um, 
but you can start talking about like, oh, you know, peanuts grow their fruit below ground. I don't know if they're fruit, but peanuts grow their thing that we're interested in below ground and potatoes do too. Like, are they, are they in some sort of similar categorization when we look at, uh, kind of that hierarchy of category categories? So we want to make sure too, that we, that we, um, as I was saying, like keeping this curiosity alive, that these are not just mere facts, like, yes, trees bear fruit, and let's say green beans bear fruit and sunflowers bear fruit. All of these things have a seed that, you know, and we don't want this to just be something that we tell them that we're giving them that education on a silver spoon. We want this to be a curiosity that leads them to their own reasoning and answering of things or finding the answer. And what that looks like usually, how we facilitate that is by asking questions. Um, this wouldn't be lecturing them on, oh, I see that you notice this. Sit down, little Abdullah, and let me tell you all about that one, like you gave me one sentence and I'm just going to fill your ears for the next 20 minutes about everything that I know about it. No, that's interesting for us. It's not interesting for them. And what's more interesting for them is for them to spend 20 minutes telling us what they've learned, what they've seen. And we should allow that um, by asking those questions like, oh, yeah, so you noticed the uh, the maple tree is starting to grow seeds. Have you seen any seeds on any other trees? Have you seen them this year? Like are other trees growing seeds right now? Or do you think that you noticed it late last year? Again, it shouldn't feel like, well, now I'm interviewing you to see if, you know, if you're good enough. But instead, a curiosity. We should remain curious. We need to model what that curiosity looks like. And sometimes that means um, being curious about what they're saying and the information they have, that they have information as well. It's not just, I have the information, you ask me and I will give it to you. Sometimes they're going to notice things that we don't notice. Sometimes they're going to come up with ideas that we never thought of before. And we need to allow for that conversation to be open. Charlotte Mason, uh, tells us also to keep calendars, keeping note of the firsts throughout the year, the first snow, the first open bud, the first blooming milkweed, the first green grass. And ideally, like you can find these in some places. I actually tried to look this up before I started recording and I couldn't find it. Um, but I think places like Barnes and Noble or whatever, they'll have like a five-year journal. So it'll say, you know, January 1st, and then there'll be like five columns to it. Excuse me, or five lines where it'll say, let's say 2023, 2024, 2025. And you can write something in each of those spaces. Um, most nature journals, she suggests, we have it now. Of course, this is like 100 years after she, you know, wrote this. It's like your... Uh, mixed media, multi-purpose type of like art notebooks that are usually on like a spiral binding. You can find them. You can find them at Target and Walmart or art stores. They have a lot of different types, but it's kind of that maybe like a 40 weight or 60 weight paper where they can, um, they can use brush drawing, which is watercoloring, but it's more like a dry watercolor or drier, damp watercoloring. Um, that it can handle that. And also like, it's not too heavy to just, you know, have some pencil, uh, you know, some notes. Some people use that and they'll make columns for it. And maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month on each page. You know, each person decides when they're really small, uh, when the children are small, like these are going to be things like, excuse me, I saw three sparrows today. I saw a crow. I saw a raccoon eating from our compost. But again, these firsts should be in there. The first bud opening, the first dandelion, the first um, uh, goose flying overhead. 
Um, so once they have that, then they can start looking forward to those things year after year. They can start saying, oh, well, it snowed this time last year. It hasn't snowed yet. I wonder if it'll snow soon. So then they're going to be watching for it and looking at the sky and looking for all these other signs. All of this is really, really important. Talking about this book, she says, Charlotte Mason says, as soon as he is able to keep it himself, a nature diary is a source of delight to a child. Every day's walk gives him something to enter, three squirrels in a larch tree, a jay flying across such a field, so on and so forth. How blind, blind, I'm sorry, how bindweed or ivy manages to climb, et cetera, et cetera. While he is quite young, such as five or six, he should begin to illustrate his notes freely with brush drawings. She goes on to say we should help with very small things like red and blue make purple. Um, but otherwise, he mostly should be doing this himself. I, from my own experience, I my kids like doing brush drawing while I'm doing it, but then they become very discouraged because mine looks better than theirs. So I would encourage for maybe that to be separate if that is a discouragement for children. Um, but also she talks about don't dictate what's in their book. It should be their book of records. They're not graded on this. There's no like, oh, you should include more detail. You know, they're going to go back through their pages. Almost every time that they open the book, they go back through their pages. It's something that's a joy for them to see what they've done before and to see the progress that they've made. And then they start thinking, what do I want to include that I can look back on later? So allow that to be their book. When they get older, they, inshallah, will also have their own uh, book of centuries. So again, that's a keepsake item for them. And it helps them to kind of, as they're doing their reading, they're thinking about this, like, what do I want to put down in my notebook? And just that alone is going to help them pay a little bit closer attention uh, when they're thinking, okay, is this, is this the most interesting thing from today? Is this the most interesting thing from today? And holding on to that to remember it for later. Uh, I would say don't allow children to just take photographs and stick it in there. That is not checking the same boxes. They can take photographs. They can put it in something else. But this nature journal is for notes about what they've seen, what they've observed, and brush drawings about those things. And then the last section that we're talking about today, it's a, the title heading says, I can't stop thinking. And she's talking about how children have an active mind. And sometimes we struggle with how to manage this. In our time, I think we tend to entertain them. There's a lot of talk in parenting circles of how do you keep your kids entertained all day. So we are putting them in camps and we're putting them in after school activities and we're signing them up for, you know, this, that, and everything in order to keep them entertained. But there's this quote that she pulls out that says, the human brain is like a millstone turning ever round and round. If it have nothing else to grind, it must itself be ground. I'm going to read this one more time. The human brain is like a millstone turning ever round and round. If it have nothing else to grind, it must itself be ground. So thinking about when we just entertain our children, they have nothing noteworthy to think about. They, they should have something worthy of their attention, not just something that's keeping their attention, something for them to ponder. She says, but pray, let him work with things and not with signs. The things of nature in their own places, meadow and hedgerow, woods and shore. So again, this is, we go to the places, we touch and experience the real things, not just look at this in a book, read about it, tell me about it. A really good example is going to the mountains, going to the beach. All of these are things that you can read in a book and you can get an idea of it. But the reality of it is not known until you experience it. And so 
still just to, just as a reminder, what we're talking about right now is still just within your local area. So this isn't, you need to travel the world and, you know, experience every different biome and uh, every different culture, though that, that is wonderful. But for most people, that's not feasible. That wouldn't be something that, you know, financially they could do and, you know, keep a full-time job and so on and so forth. But at the very least, the area in which they walk on a day-to-day basis should be something that they're familiar with, that they they know the names of these things. They're, they, she calls them like friends. And I know that that's maybe a weird phrase for us today, but when you, when you think of maybe the flowers that your grandmother used to grow in her garden, and then you see it again, there's something that stirs you that feels close enough to friendship in order to use that word. So this is what we want to create for our children, that interesting things abound outside. It's not just a place to get through from one screen to the other. Um, So that is this section on kind of plants, uh, plant life, those type of things, and how we can interact with that with our children. The next section is about living creatures. So of course, that's going to start um, talking about animals. And then we'll be talking about what town children can do as another section that she has. So that's specifically for if you're unable to get out of town. Again, I believe she was kind of in the London area or she's writing to people that she knows live in the London area. So just like you know, maybe New York and Chicago and these larger cities, especially a hundred years ago, this might be hard for them to go out and see a meadow, a field, the farmland, if they're surrounded by, you know, this is the industrial era. So they're they're surrounded by factories and um, pollution and those type of things. So we can take those ideas and bring them into our modern time for when we're not able to get out and explore in nature, inshallah. So just as an added reminder, you will gain benefit by reading this book yourself. You can find it at most of your favorite retailers, alhamdulillah. And you can also find a link to it in the description of this video or podcast. You can find me online as Middle Way Mom on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. On Instagram, I share our day-to-day life uh, homeschooling as well. If you have any questions that you'd like answered, you can email those to Shannon, that's S-H-A-N-N-E-N, at middlewaymom.com. Thank you so much, and assalamu alaikum.